Welcome back to another episode of Tainted, Tainted Warriors. Warriors. I'm Mikey. I'm Nicole. And this week we're going to talk to you a little bit about Hitler. Is in Adolf Hitler, Germany, World War II. I've got some secret weapons and whatnot that he was messing with. And I've got some like background info. Like, you know, stuff that he was up to. Not to say what like led him to this. But, you know, just what he did. Because he was a person. So, I guess, you know. Right. Take a quick little dive into what his life was like. We like to first tell you who someone is before we tell you what they were up to. Right. And we're not going to get too crazy. Like, we're not talking Holocaust today, so don't get all nervous. No, I don't think it's, yeah, it's not too, like, that deep. I think I would mention the concentration camps at some point, but don't worry. It's nothing too bad. I think the worst I have is it threw some paintings away. (laughs) But before (laughs) we get into that, we're going to start you off with our question of the week. Ooh... This week, it is, how old were you when you found out Santa wasn't real, and how did you find out? So, I, like, this is kind of cute, you know, I like, I like this story, especially for my experience, because it actually happened to me twice. So, the very first time, I was maybe, like, uh, seven. I ended up, like, I don't know, going into my mom's closet, you know, go figure, and I saw presents that were wrapped up, and, like... I had this little group that we all hung out with. And once I told them that, like, oh, I don't think Santa's real, they literally, like, put on this whole show. I'm not even kidding. Called me over to come to their house. Like, gave me a present that says from Santa and just, let, like, told me that Santa's real, but, like, he uh, needs help. So that's why he will, like, pre-deliver packages sometimes. And I was like, oh, So, you know, for, like, a couple more years, I, like, I believe that I got that little extra Christmas spirit. And then I think by the time I was, like, 12, it was just, like, all right, Santa's not real anymore, and it's time to give it up. That's kind of funny that you said 12 was when you gave it up, because I was a firm believer until I was 12. Oh, (laughs) and I did not know that or anything. (laughs) You're right. It's just how connected we are. (laughs) But, so, I went shopping with my mom one day at Kmart, right? Of all places... Kmart. Wow. Um, That's deep. <laughs> it was a lot deeper than you guys know. But we saw, it was back when the little like finger skateboards first became popular, like the tech Tech-tex. decks. Yep. yep. And I saw this ramp that I wanted really bad. And I was like, Mom, will you buy that for me? And it was near Christmas time. So she was like, well, if I do, you're not getting it till Christmas. And I'm like, okay, fine. I'm still going to get it, though. So, yeah, that's fine. And we buy it, and we go home, and then Christmas comes, and I open a gift that says, From Santa, and it's the freaking tech deck, like, skate park. Oh. And I broke, like, down, and I'm like, Mom, I'm like, this is not, like, from Santa. I was with you when you bought this. And then she's like, yeah, your aunt helped me wrap presents, and she did not know that when that particular oh. one got wrapped. And then I pouted for a minute, and I wouldn't open any more presents, and then after a few minutes, I was like, Fuck it, those are my presents, and I went and finished opening them. Right? But, I mean, yeah. I mean, that is kind of <laughs> funny. It's a little cute thing. I mean, once again, comment below if you want to get in on our question of the week. I'd love to know when whoever's watching, you know, when, when you, you guys found out. found out. That'd be really nice to know. <laughs> so, I thought it was actually pretty interesting when I found out this that Adolf Hitler actually probably had a really good chance of not being called Adolf Hitler. He actually had a chance of being uh, Adolf Schickelgruber. That sounds right. Uh, Reasoning behind this is because his father, who was born out of wedlock, his name is Alos. His name is Alos Schickelgruber. He gets adopted by his stepfather. His name is Johann George Heidler. Uh, there is some speculation, talk of the town, if you want to call it that, that uh, Johan is Alos's biological father. Like, it was more than just his stepfather. Don't know why that was kept quiet. But during all of this, as uh, the name was being changed, Hitler, H-I-T-L-E-R, is was actually the name that was printed on the birth certificate. And there's unknown... Reasoning behind that, so 
because of that situation right there is why his name is actually Adolf Hitler. Adolf's relationship with his father was not very well, but he adored his mom, who ends up passing away in 1907. Very interesting little topic is that Adolf did earn an Iron Cross first class medal, uh, medal from World War I, but his hero or his active duty in it seemed to be less hero saving and a little more just like helping handing. Like he is said to have went temporarily blind from a mustard gas situation in 1918. But there are medical reports saying that he suffered from hysterical blindness. So they believe that he just kind of used his pre-existing condition. Yes. To earn this award, which I mean, not, you know, in the person that known to have give him the recommendation for that reward was Hugo Gunman. And he was a, he was actually a Jewish lieutenant that recommended Adolf Hitler get this medal. Oh, ironic. Right? I was like, at first I was a little confused on why I wrote it like that in my notes. But yeah. it, then you remember that you're talking about Hitler. Yes, that, that was, I, I did, I found that very ironic when I wrote that. I was like, wait, Hitler and Jewish people do not go together. Very long, long history. In uh, 1924, while in prison for high treason, which I'm not too sure what that means. Uh, treason, that's like betrayal. Okay. Uh, Hitler begins writing what is considered to be one of the most, uh, world's most dangerous books, which is known as, uh, his book is Mein Kampf, which means My Struggle, which actually turns out to be published out in two volumes, which was in 1925 and 1927. Hitler in the book claimed to be a fetitional anti-Semite. Semite? Semi, semi anti Jew. Pretty cool though. In 2016, a copyright for the book actually becomes public domain. And days later, a heavily unnotated Mein Kampf was published in Germany for the first time since 1945, and it became a bestseller. I figured that I that I didn't know that. I always wanted to read that, but it was before that time. It was always weird, like trying. It was like expensive or something. I didn't want to spend the money. I right. was younger, so... Right, I wonder... It's like, that's a trip to the... Like, two trips to the diner versus, like, a book. Right. <laughs> I and I mean, yeah, when you're, like, just got out of school or... You know what I mean? Yeah. You're not, like, a book, really. Right. So now I'm going to get into kind of, like, how Hitler became so powerful, I guess is a good way of putting it. Um, in January of 1933... Hitler was appointed chan uh, Chancellor of Germany, but he wanted more power. Like, that wasn't enough. Egotistical maniac. Why would it be? Uh, <laughs> We've heard of a few of those. <clears throat> I mean, you're not wrong. Uh, he's actually, he ends up getting more power, as we all know. Uh, right after the Rich Tag Fire, which is a fire that ends up burning Germany's parliamentary the government building? Yes. Germany's parliamentary building, uh, which gave Hitler a chance to solidify his authority. Really big power. Yep. Show everybody kind of... He's the man. Yep. The day after the blaze, uh, he oversaw the, sus uh, the suspension of all civil liberties in the following month's elections. Nazis and their allies end up becoming majority vote in Rich Tag, which would lead into, on March 23, 1933, the Rich Tag passed the Enabling Act, which sanction sanctionized uh, Hitler's dictatorship, which pretty much came shortly after the death of President Paul von Heidenberg. Uh, the German people, uh, the German people voted to just give Hitler all power. They combined it, Chancellor and the President, which gave him a chance to become. I'm gonna botch this really, really, really badly. So right. For her on Rex, 
Skainsler. Fancy way of saying he's a leader <laughs> and a chancellor. He's got power, you know? Right. Um, pretty much it that I have. Except he was reported to be a billionaire about, eight, I mean, over $5 million or billion dollars. But the ways that he came about it weren't really the best. Like, he literally he did con man? He didn't pay. He did a lot. He didn't pay taxes. He was a con man. The the best thing that literally stuck out to me, though, and I this is the reason why I am throwing this in there because I had to say this, is that he literally made the government buy copies of his book then to turn around and give them as wedding gifts to everybody pretty much in Germany as a royalty gift. Mm -hmm. So in return, royalties were coming back to That's crazy. him. So, like, I guess it's... He got as much money as possible from yes. that. Oh. Like, could you imagine telling the government, like, all right, no, you're going to actually buy books, and when people get married, you're going to give them my book That's as a wedding crazy. gift, and then That's they're going to also give me stuff, too? Like, he was very shysty. I think, but that was a back look into him. So... During World War II, like, Hitler did try to, like, they had crazy experiments with the scientists and stuff we're working on. They were trying to basically conquer a world and, like, become a superior race, you know. But yeah, so the bulk of what I have is about Hitler's drug field, like, almost super soldiers, if you will. But we, I think we have some other stuff on the weapons. But let's get started with the drugs. So there was a military doctor named Otto Renke who actually experimented with a drug named Pervit provided on college students and based on his research he decided that it might actually help Germany win the war like it, he had seen that it was keeping college students awake and keeping them alert like he did a gr uh, study so there was a group of college students that took the drug and a group that did not and they were told to stay awake all night and basically like answer questions like they were taking a test or something right well the ones that didn't take the drug obviously ended up falling asleep the ones that took it were awake and obviously had better test scores because they were alert and able to focus really well. Okay, so, I can see how that connects. I, like, I was a little thrown off. I'm glad you brought it back in there because I was like, well, how do those connect at all? Right, so based on that, he actually placed Pervidin on the list of prescribed drugs for all soldiers, even though like they didn't have any studies on the long-term effects of it. They only knew that immediately, like... It, you're going to feel it, and you're right. going to feel it. The, the effect and, lasted, like, 8 to 12 hours. Which, I mean, all right, so I didn't know where this could go in, but let, let's let be honest. I did look into what, like, Hitler's doctor was injecting him with, and it probably is this... Whatever the drug was called, what was it called? Uh, Pervidin. It's probably the mixture of... I mean, they, exactly what they were saying Hitler was given, but he was given, like, oxycodone, uh, methamphetamine, cocaine, uh, and morphine. So what I'm going to say is that if if he's injecting that into Hitler, I have a feeling that's probably what he's mixing in to make well, this up. This wasn't Hitler's doctor. It was a different doctor. Oh. But if he's willing to prescribe that for all the soldiers... You know, right, like, I feel like, yeah. But you make a valid point, because Pervidin wasn't, like, it wasn't a mixture of drugs, but it was methamphetamine. It's what we today commonly call crystal meth. So. I had a feeling right off the bat, when it was said, like, right. was like oh, okay, this it, has to be a lot of, and if it's mixed, like, you know, if they want it to be for soldiers, which I guess, wow. Like, and that's something that they have to do. Like, they have to take that if they were going to go into I World War II. I don't know if they were forced to take it, but I didn't see anywhere that anybody objected to taking it. Well, I mean, um, I guess... They so. actually kept them in their, like, emergency kits. Like, there was actually a plane of the Nazis that crashed in Britain. And when Britain went and, like, retrieved the crash and whatnot, they found the first aid kit, and they found this gold foil package with a bunch of, like, a few tablets inside. Right. And they didn't know what it was at the time, but it was the, per the Pervidin, and it actually had, like, a warning on it of extreme psychological and stimulating impacts and directions that only take one or two tablets at a time. Wow. So, it was literally, like, in, like, going to the doctor and grabbing it except you're at war so it comes in your weekly shipment prescribed by a general military doctor like he had, 
I don't know who exactly he was, but he obviously had enough power that he placed it on the list for all of the soldiers to be able to take. Right. So, like, it was crazy. They actually, in 1938, per, per Biden was actually being sold over the counter in Germany. Like, it was being marked as an antidepressant, and that created alertness. So, like, even their civilians, like, Could were just... This. Right. Wow. Which, it's also understandable when you think about the fact that if you fell asleep while you were on watch during World War II, one of the punishments could be execution. So if you didn't already die because you were asleep and the enemy caught you, wow. and your friend caught you or whatever, you could be executed. Like, you know what I mean? So yeah. of course you want to stay awake, because right. literally no matter whether you fall asleep or not, your life depends on it. So the soldiers basically used it to stay awake and kind of just be focused on the task at hand, and they were... At, by the end of the war, some of them were taking them every four to eight hours. But that's a lot, considering that's the effect lot. lasts eight to twelve hours. Right. So, in May of 1940, Hitler obviously had his Blitzkrieg, which a Blitzkrieg is basically like a lightning war. It's a surprise attack using rapid, overwhelming force, if you don't know. Um, they, he did that where Germany went through Holland, Belgium, Britain, and France. And 35 million tablets of this pervaded had been sent to the front lines during that for the soldiers to take. Wow. And I don't know exactly how long it was. I think when I Googled it, it was like May, I want to say like May 10th to June 25th or something like that. Which, what, what is that, like six weeks maybe? Yes, if that, yeah. And like at that time, supposedly France was like actually a really good like military power. Which I had always, people always made fun of France and everything I've seen. I've never researched their military. Right. But, I mean, if they're like a really good military power and you're plowing through them, that's why they were like, this drug is giving us the, the advantage. Power. Like, yeah. our soldiers are now unstoppable. The soldiers were literally going three to four days without sleeping, where they were just moving and kept, like, kept fighting, kept going. And, like, even if they were under harsh conditions, like if they were too hot or too cold or whatever, they were drugged up, so they didn't actually, like, feel, feel it. it. Yes. So, like, there was some point um, during, like, they... So Russia had actually, at the beginning of the war, they were on the Axis side, but I believe by the end of the war, I think in 1941, they flipped over to the Axis side because Germany invaded Russia. Um, when Germany was ended up having to retreat from Russia, they were on this drug... And, like, their feet, some of them were so frostbitten, they had to have their feet amputated. Because nobody knew that their feet were freezing to the point of frostbite in, that like, that level that they'd have to amputate it because they were just high on methamphetamine. That's crazy. Right. So, I mean, literally, it's perfect for your soldiers. It makes them indestructible. But, like, that's, that's crazy to think. Like, I don't know, your right. entire military force is on this, on right. the battle lines? How are we supposed to stop that? I already said basically what this is, but I do have a little note here of what is pervidin. It's methamphetamine, which is a stimulant that increases your energy and focus. It increases the pleasure chemical dopamine in your brain. And it does have the 8 to 12 hour effect, so the soldiers would be alert, courageous. They were basically ruthless killers with no ability to feel empathy towards who they were attacking, you know? Uh -huh. So it's literally just a killing monster. What they didn't know, because they didn't know the long-term effects, is that eventually, after like weeks of constantly using this, you can start to hallucinate, you can have mental breakdowns, and like just psychosis can occur. Which, that's not something you would really want on the battlefield when you're fighting an enemy <laughs> and surrounded by, I don't even know how many of your own soldiers. So, in June of 1941, the health minister Leonardo Conti actually passed a law to make permanent prescription only for the civilians in Germany and restrict the military to use it only in extreme conditions. So, there were declassified documents, I don't know when they were declassified, but they show that that order was ignored by the military. The production was actually ramped up to over 600,000 tablets a day. And another pharmaceutical company opened up just to make Pervitin for the military. Um, there were soldiers that even wrote home asking their friends and family that if they had a, like, 
can you have a prescription made when you send it to me? Or if you have one, can you send it? Like, I need a backup supply. Get me a backup supply somehow. Like, you know what I mean? Like, right. Like, what any drug addicts, honestly, Could go if through. you're fiending, you're going to probably try to go through someone. Because they didn't even understand that they were drug addicts. You know right. what I mean? They're blindly. Right. Like, they feel like they needed to, like, because their life's at risk. Because they could die if they fall asleep. Right. You know, like, so really. Yeah, I mean, it's life and death for them. So. And then they have the the actual feeling of addiction on top of it. Right. That's crazy. Yeah. Um, there was actually one case where hallucinating soldiers fired at an enemy with, until they ran out of ammo. And then the next morning, the enemy actually came. And they had no ammo to fight them off. Because the enemy wasn't there when they shot all their ammo. Wow. They were just hallucinating. Um, Germany did try to find an alternate drug. I don't know exactly. I don't have to. I should have written more dates down. I'm sorry. But this is the only part that's kind of like super disturbing, I think, in everything that I have. Is they did use prisoners in the concentration and death camps as like guinea pigs. They would use, they would put 70 pound backpacks on starving prisoners' backs. And then they would make them walk and run in circles on a path. Like it was a circle path that had different kinds of stone and like grounding. So right. they could, like, they would have them test sneakers. Different and see, sorts of terrain. To yes, to... exactly. To see how it impacted them. They would force them to go on for days at a time and beat them if they, if they stopped. Um, it was actually called Pill Patrol, where prisoners were given either liquid cocaine, crystal meth, or chewing or powdered cocaine. And then they did find, like, they found based off that study that all the drugs had a similar effect. They were all staying awake for three to four days, regardless of what drugs they took. Right. So, yeah, they kept, the Nazis kept those results in mind, and they were working. I know, it seems like I'm going left field, but I promise this connects. Um, they were working on a new U-boat, which was like a submarine, basically. And they created a two-man micro-sub that was nearly impossible to detect. Um, I don't know why I didn't put the details in there, but I'm pretty sure, like, it was just small. It was a two-man sub when they went down in there. Like, it was super narrow, and, like, they could barely move it, basically. Like, th they could just hear nothing but, like, the engine right. on the inside. So... The two men that were supposed to pilot the micro-sub were given a D9 cocktail. The cocktail contained cocaine, morphine, and crystal meth. So, I mean, we're probably not surprised to hear this, but nobody came back alive and no micro-subs ever resurfaced. So, that didn't work. But if you think about that, that's what Mikey said. Hitler's doctor was injected into him. Plus, yeah. there was something else, too, right? Yeah, oxycodone. Yeah. So, Hitler was even more fucked up than these micro-sub pilots that are trained to, like, do this shit. And That's crazy. I mean, there were probably... I'm sure there was, like, body conditions. Well, that, that's why they were being given drugs. Because these new, like, designs were basically, I think, supposed to take them deeper. Or, like, do some kind of stealth thing that hadn't been done right really so they had to make sure that the body could take these kinds of conditions for as long as they needed to and they figure if you give them drugs like the, the guys are on land are doing great with crystal meth in them right or i'm so, sorry pervidin right. so if we give these guys a d9 cocktail maybe they'll push on and be great in the water right they were already having success so i believe they were already having success so in that case, you're going to ramp up the success and win the war, you know, pretty quick. So like I said, though, that one Nazi plane did crash and Britain got their hand on the tablets. So, of course, they tried to figure out what they were. And Britain was an ally. So the allies did try. I don't know if I really need to say that, but I don't know if people know that Britain right. was an ally. I so, didn't know until you just said it. So. Okay. So, in case you don't know, Britain was on the Allied side, the U.S. side, the good side of World War II. Um, and the Allied forces did try to create their own war drug, as they called it. They did use volunteer recruits, though, for their testing. So, it's not like they were like, okay, all you people... Everybody needs right, to like, do it. Like, no, this is sign people up. People that are already 
I don't know, hours from death probably, you go out there and do all this crazy shit with all this on your back. Like, they asked for people to volunteer. Right. And people did volunteer, and eventually they found a drug called uh, Benzedrine that came out on top. And I don't, I don't know why I didn't write anything on that itself. But um, it came out on top, and it basically confirmed that when they were on it, the soldiers took more risks to basically damage the enemy. So they became more courageous. That Like, basically, they were more willing to commit suicide to if it would help win the battle against the enemy. Right. Um, in 1942, in Northern Africa, they actually, there was 100,000 Benzedrine that were ordered for soldiers to take. Like, they could take as much as they wanted. And, like, again, they were become brave to the point of suicide. They went three straight days driving through minefields and, like, just fighting in battle. And so the unit ceased to exist, and the Allies won the first amphetamine-fueled battle. <laughs> Like, which is crazy. crazy. You think it's a war of drugs. It and is. Amphetamines versus methamphetamines. What the? Are you serious? Like That's crazy. So, yeah. And then just a little fun fact about Pervitin is even after the war, civilians were trying to buy it in Germany on the black market. And the German East and West armies were still supplied it. So, it didn't really do anything. Like, right. They still had a crystal meth problem. Um, so that's just kind of crazy to think that our Nazi soldiers were being fueled by drugs and that we countered it by right. drugs, drugging our soldiers also. <laughs> but now we have a war against drugs, so I don't even know where, what happened. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm not saying do drugs, I'm just saying, like, I don't, I'm not supporting, don't go do crystal meth. I'm just telling you what happened. What, right. Like. What science is pretty much... Right. It was pervitin. They didn't call it crystal meth. I, they didn't have the long term effects. But, I mean, by the end of the war, they should have. Right. But, I don't know. It is not there was much detail about it. Right. Because it was probably just crystal meth. <laughs> right. I don't know if this. <laughs> Like, I was writing all this stuff, and I'm like, I don't know if this is how they got these ideas. But Germany was actually, like, super technologically, like, they were leading the industry in technological advancement. In the 1920s, even, they were leading. There was a guy named Hermann Oberth, who actually led the way he wanted to create interplanetary rockets and an orbital ref reflector. And, like, he was pretty open about what he wanted to do in, like, scientific studies, like, all that stuff was pretty open until Hitler gained power. And then all their scientific advancements, like, began to stay quiet. Why would Hitler want to tell you what his plan is? Right. He's not going to tell you what advances. It's a security thing, really, and honestly, I think nowadays any president would do that. Um, I'm going to guarantee we don't know everything that the U.S. has as far as, like, weapons and whatnot. Totally. It's really weird how the color keeps changing, but it keeps happening, guys, so if I it know, happens in the final video, then I'm sorry. So Germany, they actually created the world's first long-range rocket, um, and basically paved the way for cruise missiles as we know them today. It was called the Vengeance Rocket, and they didn't just make one, of course. Like, if you make one rocket, you're going to continue to make different kinds of models. So the V2 actually was, like, Way more dangerous than the V1. From what I saw, the V1 really, like, would just kind of go up and run, then run out of fuel and kind of fall where it ran, ran out of fuel. Right. Um, but the V2 was a liquid fuel rocket with longer range and greater payload, and I'm pretty sure it was, like, a guided missile. Um, but it would fly straight up and then, like, border space, which, now think about it, at that time, we don't go to space. Right. So it's going to basically be at the bottom of space, and then it would fall back down like faster than the speed of sound before the city it hit even knew it was coming. So, like, you wouldn't even hear it coming because it's falling faster than the speed of sound. It would just go up and then fall back down super fast and then hit the target city, like like New York City, for That's example. That's crazy. They also were trying to create something called the Silverbird, which was in, an intercontinental bomber. It would launch on a rocket-propelled track, and it would reach the lower level of orbit. So I'm pretty sure it's, like, the lower level of, like, the atmosphere. Like, space atmosphere. I don't know these terms, but, like, 
the lower level of space. Right. Basically. Yeah. And then it would skip across the Earth's atmosphere. So you know how you throw a rock in the water and you skip a rock? Yeah. That's basically what it would be doing on Earth's atmosphere. And then while it's doing that, it would be able to, as it bounces back down, it would be able to drop bombs onto different cities. So, oh like, Germany God. could launch it, drop bombs on New York City or, like, whatever, and then the plane could land in Japan because Japan was on Germany's side. Nobody, you know, again, nobody would ever really that's see crazy. it coming. Right. So, they had some crazy stuff happening. Um, another crazy thing they had happening, or that they were trying to design, rather, and I believe they actually, yeah, they did have blueprints for it, was a solar death ray. They planned to put, basically, like, a space station into space, because, again, this is, you know, 1930s, 1940s. We don't have anything in space. So they were planning to build a space station much like our ISS now. And they would basically have like a one mile wide mirror that would harness the, the solar power from the sun. So the sun's rays would hit it and then they would reflect it back into a specific point on Earth and just obliterate anything that it was touching. <laughs> so if you're a little confused on that, think about how you get a magnifying glass and you hold it so that the sun shines on an ant on the sidewalk and it it kills it. I never personally did that, but I, right. I always heard that. I actually see the survivor, like a survivor. So what they would do, like, because they need to start fire, people that have glasses would break their glasses and put the two lenses together and hold that over, like, their kindling or whatever. For, I mean, a couple hours, obviously. But that right. would literally just be enough to spark and get that light. They'd have fire. That's just your glasses. And that should, well. Right, that's just your glasses. This so is a mile-wide mirror. Right. Harnessing the sun's power. Like, that's why I figured outer was, space, like, that's so. crazy of the amount that that could right. damage. It would have obliterated everything. Yeah. Um, there was a man named Sigmund Rasher who was tasked with uncovering the limits of high altitude on humans. Which, he, of course, he did at a concentration camp. Where, so they kind of put them in like this harness thing. Like I think our astronauts now have to go through similar training to just make sure their bodies can withstand what they're going to experience in space. Um, so they built like these chambers that were high-low pressure chambers to kind of simulate how high-altitude flying would affect them. And they just kind of like... They ended up, like, going limp and ended up just kind of, like, hanging in the parachutes, which is kind of sad. I don't know if anything else happened. I didn't write that down, and I forgot to, like, look further into that. I got a little distracted when I was rewriting this part. I'm sorry. But even that is, like, you're doing it with people against their will, and you don't know what effect that's having on them right. internally as they're hanging there. And I'm guessing that as they're hanging there... They're probably not stopping because they probably want to see what effect it has if you continue. Because if you pass out in space, you don't get to instantly leave. Like, right. you have to wait until you're at least can be rescued or float back down somehow. So, or they just kick you out. It is Nazis. They might just throw you out into space and let your body float away. That's true. And even though it's cruel, that actually did help make way for, like, how, like, space medicine now, like, advances that we've made to help our people feel safe when they travel in space now. And it's kind of funny that he was doing that too because Hitler was also working on basically a UFO. He had this bell-shaped craft called the Glocky, which is, I believe, German for the bell. It would have been an anti-gravity propulsion system which would have had high-voltage cylinders that spun to create a highly powerful electric field to basically counter Earth's gravitational pull. So if you go against gravity, instead of being pulled down, you're allowed to go up. Right. Or raise. Whoa. Yeah, right? Like, that's kind of cool. That's a game changer in any, like, space, tra <laughs> like, any air travel, honestly. Right. honestly. It was rumored that the technology for that, for the anti-gravitational system, was being reversed engineered from a damaged craft that landed in Black Forest in 1936. Supposedly, there were investigators that found a dish-shaped object with the remains of some extraterrestrials inside. 
But within hours, the SS took possession of the down craft and, of course, the deceased crew. I do say rumored, and supposedly, because I didn't double check it, it could just be a rumor, but it's interesting to think about because as I was reading that, what it did remind me of was Roswell, which was 1947, and look at the technological advances we made in the U.S. since then. There was a man named Victor Schauberger who developed a vortex engine that would actually use friction between vortices to and surrounding air to force the air downward, which would kind of create an overall lifting effect. So it would basically create this air bubble underneath you that's raising you up like a cloud almost. Right. Because clouds are made of water, right? As water evaporates, they become yeah. clouds. So it literally would be a cloud of whatever air is surrounding the craft. That's pretty cool. And what's weird about that, though, is he said that he didn't even discover that technology. He rediscovered it from Sanskrit texts, which were in India, and used a similar system. I thought it was also, like, even farther that it was weird, because in Sanskrit, swastika, which was a symbol of the Nazi party, means good fortune. There was also ancient texts that connected the swastika with ETs, like extraterrestrials. So he's trying to build an alien, like a UFO craft, and using a swastika, and he believes in all this mythology shit. But like, you can even, you can see the swastika like in ancient history with like Hindu uh, gods and like in temples and whatnot. Yeah. Like, I don't know if I said this in the podcast or if I just told you, but Hitler was obsessed with ancient mythology, occult, and gaining knowledge. He believed that he could muster more knowledge than before others could. That's cool. But yeah, he and other Nazi officials actually believed that the Aryans were a superior race, which we all know to be a fact. But one possible reason for that belief is that they they descended from extraterrestrials and had been bestowed tremendous powers on Earth, so they were basically just taking the rightful place as the superior beings on Earth, which is, is crazy. Yeah. I don't for, I don't think I believe that, but I don't know, because i got to imagine there's some bad aliens out there, too, but I don't know. And Einstein, Albert Einstein, we all know him. Yeah. He actually warned President Roosevelt when Otto Hahn and Fritz Strafman inadvertently split an atom, discovering fit fission, that German Germany's progress could lead to a powerful new bomb creation. It could cause radiation poisoning in the atmosphere and annihilation of living things on Earth. Wow. So it's crazy to think that like even Einstein was warning about the technology that Germans had. That's crazy. So that's funny that she brought up Einstein, who was actually given a Nobel Peace Prize, uh, a Nobel Peace Prize, and Hitler, in 1939, a Swedish legislator nominated Hitler for a Nobel Peace Prize. As a joke, they, you know, I don't think it was really meant to be serious. A drug addict, egotistical maniac like Hitler, though, I do right. believe he found that to be a serious, probably ran with it. Right. But this literally caused an uproar. People were very mad about it. And it was Karl von Olenzinski that... Nominated him? Yes. He nominated Hitler, but he actually won the prize in 1936 for the previous year of 1935. I'm not sure how that works or like... Because it seemed like seemed like he got his prize in 1936, but he was awarded it in 1935. Hmm. Maybe they have to verify the find your findings or something after they pick a winner. I yeah, know. I wasn't sure. But and he was a vocal critique of Hitler. Um, this was seen as an insult to Germany. So, like, them revolt, like, not letting Hitler get the Nobel Peace Prize. Germany took that, like, Personal. In, yes, insulting. So Hitler ran with that and ends up making his own prize, which is known as the, the German National Prize for Arts and Science. I'm not sure. I didn't look into how many people like won that, how long that went for. But that did cause the next three Germans that did win a Nobel Peace Prize to have to decline it. They were still given a diploma and a medal, but they just didn't have like a big ceremony, ceremony for them. 
That's crazy. Not as crazy as the fact that that just ended like that because we feel like we struggle on our closings all the time. <laughs> and I feel like that was right. just so perfect. We do have a song of the week for oh, you. Yeah. This week we went with BYOB by System of a Down because I feel like that's very fitting. Right. When you're talking about war and evil monsters like Hitler. I agree. <laughs> You know, right? Just definitely a uh, very fitting song. Sure, for this is. angry, confused, drugged up man. <laughs> right. <laughs> With that being said, guys, this was another episode of Tainted, Tainted Warriors. Warriors. Thank Make you. sure you subscribe, like, comment. You know, do all that stuff. All Love us. Best. Thank you so much, guys, again, and bye. bye. <laughs>